I want to thank everybody for being here. I know it's the beginning of August. You're not really supposed to hold events in August, and you're all supposed to be on vacation. So uh, I'm glad everybody's here. I um, just want to take a few moments to kind of frame how this is going to go. This panel, I think, was really put together with a very specific purpose in mind. It was really to take a deeper dive into this debate on what the role of government is uh, in technology development, really by adding that some real-world perspectives uh, on this um, from both the public and the private sector, especially from those that really uh, very recently have been in the weeds on this issue. Um, I think we can all agree without a doubt that science, technology, innovation uh, are the core drivers of, of American prosperity and growth. Um, we all know the anecdotes of kind of where a lot of these technologies have come from, government investments in things like the internet and GPS and shale gas fracking and solar panels and cheap carbon fibers, uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but really over the last year or two, I would say in earnest, uh, there's been a questionable appetite for expanding these investments or really just continuing these investments in technology development. And the driver of this has been this kind of ongoing debate on the role of government uh, in investing in innovation. Um, since World War II, just to give you a sense, you know, federal policies artificially divided basic research uh, from the rest of the innovation life cycle. The government invests in basic research that has no obvious commercial application and then kind of industry takes care of the rest. But when policy kind of breaks from this or attempts to break from this, oftentimes controversy ensues. Um, most prominently, this is kind of playing out in the budget deficit debate where uh, I think a lot of folks can't really find a consensus on what to cut. Do we cut research? Do we expand research? What kind of research do we cut? Uh, where do loan guarantees and things like that fit in? Do we, how do we address that with entitlement spending? Um, so you get this federal budget debate that's kind of in this odd stalemate, this status quo, uh, really at a time where uh, it, we really need it not to be. And kind of this debate's also playing out in a more philosophical way. Um, I'm sure many of you saw the op-ed by uh, Gordon Krovitz in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago questioning the role of government uh, in developing the internet. Uh, and then earlier this week, Vince Cerf uh, had a piece in Roll Call, and he also was kind of doing the media circuit last year, rebutting that, uh, that argument kind of from his experience at DARPA. And so this debate over the origin of the internet it really is just kind of a microcosm of the broader role of government debate. Um, but even though that kind of that debate's kind of in gridlock, the need for public support, as myself and ITIF often argue, um, is really never been greater. In fact, I think public investments in things like science, research, development, demonstration, and even commercialization, uh, what we would call more broadly innovation, is at the heart of America's future: economic growth, job creation, our international competitiveness, and as well as dealing with com some of our biggest challenges, things like climate change. Um, so I think we can all agree in some way that something has to give in this debate. So that's kind of the purpose of this event, really to, we have some really top-notch panelists uh, with us today to expand on this topic. Um, obviously, I don't think the four of them need an introduction, but just very, very quickly, uh, to my immediate left, we have Ruma Jumdar. He was the first director of RP, um, just got started in October of 2009, a position he held until earlier this year. And during his tenure at RBE, he really was, I think, the premier voice and advocate for clean energy innovation. And I would say, I think, really led the charge for the need for energy innovation to solve our big energy and climate challenges. Uh, to Arun's left is Eric Toon. He is the principal deputy director of RBE, where he leads in oversight for all of RBE's programs. Um, previous to that, he was, and I think still is, the program manager for RPE's electrofuels program, which is investing in some of these breakthrough ideas um, to make next generation biofuels that are 10 times more efficient, kind of one of the leading uh, clean energy needs. And previous to that, Eric's also a professor at Duke University, uh, as well as an entrepreneur. Um, to Eric's left is Bart Gordon. Uh, Bart currently is a partner at the Washington DC office of K&L Gates, but I think most of you know him better for his 25 years in the House of Representatives uh, for the state of Tennessee, where he was really, I think, the leading advocate in the House for all things uh, science and technology related, things like energy policy, public investments, um, as well as a, a prominent supporter of RPE while he was chairman of the House Science and Tech Committee. And then to Bart's left is Kathleen Kingscott. Uh, her title is Senior Director for Strategic Partnerships at IBM Research. 
Uh, her responsibilities include working with government to kind of form these collaborative research partnerships. But in reality, I would say Kathleen is uh, one of the leading voices in the private sector on science and technology policy issues, as well as that intersection of public and, and private institutions. Um, so I think her perspective is really key here. Um, so I'm going to to shut up and just we have until 2:30. I think what you know we'll do is spend the next 50 minutes or so. I'm um, just having a really good, healthy discussion, and we'll open it up to, to questions. Um, I think each of the panelists are uh, going to give a short opening statement on kind of their thoughts on what the role of government is in science and technology in the 21st century. And just and also as an add-in, uh, we are webcasting this uh, as well, so don't, I don't know, make sudden movements or anything like that. Um, uh, so I think with that, uh, I think we'll start with, with Arun. Great. First of all, it's great to be back in Washington. Can you hear me? It's great to be back in Washington. I'm enjoying the heat and the humidity. Uh, uh, I don't miss that <laughs> back in California. But it's. Uh, let me just first thank ITIF uh, for organizing this. I really appreciate that and inviting me for it. So I uh, thank you for that. In terms of the role of the government, and, and I hope you get into the discussion, not just in the panel, but with, with you all. I mean, I, as, as you mentioned, this is something that in terms of research, um, and this is what ARPA-E funds, is research. Research in translating science into a technology, into an idea that actually can create technologies. And the government in the past has always always done that, whether it is DARPA or even before that. And I, this is something that I think we should be doing. We used to have in our nation, we used to have laboratories like the Bell Labs and, and others, um, you know, RCA Labs, etc., which had, you know, led to many discoveries and translation of science into technologies. And if you look at the Bell Labs, which I, I get to hear a lot, um, uh, about Bell Labs, in terms of what we do today, even the technologies that, that we touch and feel, a lot of that can be traced back. But we don't have Bell Labs today. And now more than ever, I think this is so important for someone to take the risk of, of looking at how, not just to do science, which I think is very important, is basic science, but to translate the science into something into an idea that something this could be useful somewhere. And if you do not do that in the global landscape today, um, we could be shut out in the future. And you know, just a few days ago, I used the analogy, I think it's fresh in our mind, of the Olympics. You know, uh, in the global energy landscape, uh, we, you know, we had a lot of home runs, we had a lot of gold medals. But if you are to get the, uh, the Michael Phelps in the future, in the energy landscape, uh, we have to invest in the early stage and nurture things. Otherwise, we could be shut out in, uh, in the metal stands in the future. And I think it's really, really important that we nurture early, early stage, not just the science, but the translation of science into technologies. And this is what RPE was created to do. And thanks to Bart and many other people in, in Congress, as well as the Gathering Strong Committee that proposed it. Uh, and that was that's what it's doing, and that's what DARPA was created to do, which led to many of the technologies that we use today. So I think, as far as I'm concerned, this is a no-brainer. Well, I'd certainly uh, echo Arun's remarks about the need for investment uh, in our future. If we look at uh, R&D spending in the United States between 1960 and the early 2000s, that number was relatively constant, but I think that that relatively constant number masked a steady decline in the federal portion of that. And I think that the situation is, is today uh, even more dire. 75% uh, of uh, all federal R&D expenditures go to either research or go to either defense uh, or to health, about 50% to, to uh, defense and about 25% to health. And many of those investments in defense are not even what we would consider research. They're late stage weapons developments, things like that. So there's been a steady uh, decrease in, in the funds that are available 
to support that early stage innovation, both in fundamental science, the sort of shoulders on which technology development stands, and on that actual early stage translation. I think that we've seen that uh, the, the, the private sector uh, is increasingly reticent to take on uh, long-term technical risk. Arun mentioned Bell Labs, but I think you only need to look and see what's happened to research in the pharmaceutical sector uh, in the United States over the past few years to realize that that, that industrial support that I think in some ways masked the, 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 the decline in federal funding um, is, is, is also changing um, and, and not for the better. At the same time, if you look at what's going on in the BRICS, and especially in China, uh, we see a steady increase in support uh, for research. There is going to be a new global economic order, right? There is. There simply is. There's no two ways about that. Um, and so, so, so not participating is, is not an option, or, or not participating is participating in a way, right? I mean, it's, it's a choice, and it's a choice um, that'll have very real consequences um, going forward. So to adapt to that new order um, and to find our place in it, uh, continued support for uh, basic research and early stage applied research is, is absolutely vital wherever it comes from. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, a, a quick um, uh, correct. Oh, wait, oh, here we go. Thanks, Matt. A quick correction. Um, it was 26 years, not 25, but who's counting? <laughs> who's counting? Uh, I was lucky I had a lot of help with folks like Chris King, who was uh, the rank, our, our staff director uh, for energy. Um, and I don't think you're going to find this as a debate. That's another correction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> At least there may be some debate once we have a discussion out here. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll uh, quickly get into the amen uh, uh, corner. Um, uh, being here with all these scientists, I, I'll point out that my science is political science. So uh, I'll try to maybe address that area, but much of it's following up on, on Eric. And that is that there are approximately 7 billion people in the world right now. And of those 7 billion, almost half make less than $2 a day. So if we try to compete on wages in this global economy, then it's going to be a race uh, to the bottom. And uh, my 11-year-old daughter is going to inherit a national standard of living you know, less than, uh, and her whole generation less than, than my generation. Uh, so I think that we need to we need to recognize that, which means that we're going to have to invest in research and we're going to have to invest in education. Um, but then when you look at what's going on now, uh, you see that over the last several years that our federal uh, research dollars have been pretty, you know, been stagnant where the, and Kathleen can speak to it, but the, with the corporate uh, investment from by and large is going down. And most uh, corporate CEOs will tell you that if they can't turn a profit in three years, uh, they can't justify uh, to their shareholders uh, to, um, to make those investments. So that's a very dangerous uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, and so if the private sector isn't going to make the investment, then it leaves it to the public sector to be able to do that through our universities and through our national labs. And I, I think that, you know, we may later talk about basic research, implied research, and where where does that line, where is that drawn. Uh, but the private sector is not going to just reach into our, our, our blue sky uh, basic research. I mean, you're going to have to have it a little, a little further along. And, and the other area of investment that I think goes hand in hand is education. And when I say education, I'm not talking about just uh, a few, you know, bright PhDs. We've got to have uh, high school graduates, junior college graduates uh, with good STEM backgrounds so they can work at that higher level. We have to be a value added economy uh, here. Uh, and if we're going to cure all those, we might as well cure one more thing, and that is <laughs> that we have got to uh, do a better job of keeping those advanced degree students from around the world that come here uh, to the magnet of our universities. Um, I mean, it's a cliche for, I guess, everybody here, but it needs to be probably said again. And, you know, if you graduate with a master's or, or advanced degree uh, and have a job, certainly uh, you should be able to have a green card to stay here. Uh, we can't, uh, we want to homegrown, homegrow as much of our talent as we can, but that's not how we got to where, where we are. So I'll pass it on to the additional amen corner here with Kathleen. <laughs> And, and thanks, Matt, for inviting me to participate today. So what I'd like to do is bring the point of view from a, as a company representative and in industry to the mix. So we look at research. I'm at the IBM company, and we look at research 
as an enterprise, a public sector enterprise and a private sector enterprise. And I think the private sector enterprise is, if you look at R&D altogether, is about two-thirds of the expenditure in the United States, and the public sector is one-third. And these are different but complementary enterprises. As was mentioned, most private sector enterprise research is not at basic the basic research level, although my company, I have to say, is slightly different. We still have the Watson Lab. It is the probably the preeminent research lab, private sector research lab in the world, so we're really proud of that. But in any case, I think the most important thing we could be thinking about is the role of government in trying to connect these two different but complementary research enterprises. And I think that the federal government has some unique roles in doing that has a role as a, a collaborator and a partner, has a role as a convener, it has a role as a market stimulator, has a role as a regulator, and it has a role as a user. So I'll just, I won't touch on all of those because I, there's too much to talk about, but let me just focus on this collaborated, collaborative partnership role because I think that's a, a role that's been under the microscope for a long time, you know, in the, in the policy debate. So, I'll use a couple of examples, technology examples. If you think about high-end computing, federal government has been involved, particularly through DOE, in high-performance computing for almost two decades. It started very aggressively in the mid-90s around the need for modeling and simulation of our nuclear weapons. And we needed to be able to understand the fissile material within nuclear weapons because we could no longer test above-ground active testing. So we went to modeling and simulation, but we didn't have the technology to do it. So DOE and IBM worked collaboratively, and there are other companies involved as well, but on developing the highest end of supercomputing to manage our nuclear stockpile. Along the way, the United States gained leadership in this technology area, and we have had very successful work together in high-end computing. But the challenge to our economic competitiveness has been that this technology has not been really accessible to industry at large because it requires high level of technical expertise and it requires a high level of capital investment. So companies that are capital intensive like Boeing could use it for aerospace development or Lockheed could use it in the military um, platform as well as in private sector platforms. Um, pharmaceutical companies could use high-end computing for the development of drugs. Oil exploration for companies like Exxon, very high in te uh, intensive, technology intensive, high skilled requirements. But the general American industry, small and medium sized business, didn't have any ability to access and use that technology. So about a year ago, and more recently, six weeks ago, DOE and IBM announced a collaborative arrangement at Lawrence Livermore Lab called the High Performance Computing Investment or Innovation Center to make that technology available to companies at large so that the benefits of that technology could be spread more widely across industry. And I think that's a terrific role for government in terms of participating in the technology capability of our nation. At the other end of the technology IT spectrum, high-end computing at one end, at the other end of semiconductor technology, you know, America is the leading creator of semiconductor technology. Semiconductors are the largest export product that the United States has. Well, how do we get that leadership? We got that leadership by joint development between DARPA and industry over the, for a long time, but over recently, in the last 15 years, our DARPA and about seven, ten IT companies have been working together to invest in university-based research to understand the device capabilities, to develop new devices, to look at materials, to figure out how to take these semiconductor devices and, and package them more effectively. And so just uh, three, two months ago in April, we announced jointly with DARPA a collaborative, the next phase of the collaborative research program in semiconductor technology. And so we're receiving proposals now for university-based research to develop the technology, the skills, the understanding that will enable the United States to both achieve the economic vitality and the national security requirements that we've enjoyed for the last 50 years. Another example, this collaborative partnership 
um, approach is what NSF and NIST do with industry again in nanotechnology and in developing the next switch. You know, I think everybody's heard about Moore's Law and we're on this track to increase the performance of semiconductor technology, but there's a sort of a brick wall, you might say. So how, what are we going to do once we hit the brick wall of physics? We have to find a new way to uh, continue the advancements in semiconductor technology. And so the nation that leads that will achieve the same kind, or no, I don't know if it's the same, but very similar kind of growth and national security benefits that the United States has achieved for the last 50 years. So, you know, we say, let's go for it. This is a really appropriate role for the government to play. And I think this is, um, the fact that that kind of role sometimes comes under attack is really an unfortunate thing. I'll make one more point and then be quiet. Uh, the government has another really unique role, and I think that is one of a convener. When, when government agencies put funding onto the table, all sorts of organizations come together that wouldn't come together otherwise. Large companies, small companies. And this is a really useful um, uh, mix because each of these organizations brings assets to the mix that, that, is val that are valuable to the other. So for instance, large companies have skills around project management and they have a long vision and they have very deep and well-managed supply chains. Small companies don't have access to those kinds of skills typically, but small companies have great niche expertise, which large companies value. So when these government projects come into play, all these folks come out of the woodwork and they work together and they create base technologies that they then take back into their own companies and sell, put their own bells and whistles on it and sell. But that convening role is really critical and nobody can do it except government. So with that, I'll turn it back to Matt. So I think we can say the event's over. It's a no-brainer, right? So <laughs> I don't have to talk anymore. But I think to push this a little, uh, a little bit harder, I mean, obviously, all four of you kind of agree on this, but uh, that's not necessarily uh, the, the common view on, say, the Hill or in D.C. in general. For example, not to bring up Solyndra, but a report was le released today that, that said Solyndra is representative of what happens when government invests in anything. Uh, essentially, so you know, what's the hesitance of supporting kind of these government investments? I mean, maybe we'll start with Bart. I mean, you were in the weeds, like so. What? Where does this break down? Where does it not become the no-brainer that Arun was talking about? Well, first of all, I think we need to, to point out that um, politicians and journalists uh, get a lot more play out of those things that don't work than the things that do work. Um, uh, what Kathleen was talking about the semiconductor industry, and there's lots of other successes. Um, and again, it works, so you don't really talk about it. It's, it's the things that, that don't work you talk more about. Um, but there is really there is a, uh, a a fundamental change in attitude in Congress right now. Now, uh, clearly, austerity is part of that. Um, but there are there are you know those members of Congress and the public who very sincerely believe that there is no role for the federal uh, government in the area of research. That if some research is needed, uh, then the private sector will do it because there's a profit that can come about. And, you know, and again, uh, I, I don't agree with them, but they, that there, are, there, are, there are those that are very sincere about that. Um, there's some others that take that view that aren't as sincere, but that are being sort of, in, you know, intimidated. Uh, by a again a, a, an anti-government uh, view, uh, there is another you know a segment uh, that thinks okay yes there you know some government research is legitimate but it needs to be you know very deep basic research uh, and as we've discussed uh, now uh, that simply doesn't get us far enough. Uh, and then uh, you have a lot of folks who think that yes research is important, but so is um, uh, food for hungry children, and so, you know, is for highways, or so are um, um, funds for public housing, whatever it might be. So you're, you're getting into this sort of a, you know, you're getting squeezed from different points, and it's much easier to stop something than to uh, start something, particularly in this er era of austerity. And I think the other thing that, that, that Eric sort of mentioned that 
is not viewed by the public or by Congress is that we're not in a void here. Uh, just because we're not investing doesn't mean that Europe is not investing, the Chinese aren't investing, that the Asian, you know, that, that everybody is not investing. Because we're saying the Finns, I mean, they're probably, you know, have a higher increase in investment than anywhere else. And their economy is reflecting that uh, right now. So, um, uh, all that said, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a difficult uh, environment. And I think it's going to really have to lead uh, with Kathleen and with the business community. It's got to step up uh, and explain to the public and explain to Congress uh, that this is not corporate welfare, that this is, um, you know, an investment uh, in our country. Uh, and if we don't do it, we're going to see a, a reduction in our standard of living. And maybe to build off that, Kathleen, why isn't the business community kind of clamoring for this, like kind of saying we really need more of this? Well, I think they are. Um, so there's your controversy, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, there are a number of organizations. For instance, the Semiconductor Industry Association, the BR, the Business Roundtable, the um, ITI. Um, there's an organization called the Task Force on American Innovation that's made up of business community members and university members. And all of these have, among their public policy agendas, um, a strong support for investment in science and technology from the federal government at both the basic level and at the applied and development level. You know, the challenge, I think, from a business community point of view is that um, when CEOs come into town to make their case to on the Hill, I think it's common knowledge that you can only have two or three things on your agenda, max, right? I mean, you can't go into a member of Congress and say, I'd like you to do these 10 things. You have to have one, two, and three. So when you have a, an active tax debate going on, when you have an active um, debate around trade and international investment, um, it's really hard for companies to raise that or healthcare or other sort of more domestically oriented public policy issues. It's hard for companies, for CEOs, to put university-based research at the top of their um, policy agenda. It doesn't mean they don't support it. It just means when a member says, what are the two things you want me to do? It may not be among those top two things because it's not something that affects their company tomorrow. It's something that affects their company over time in the course of history. I was hoping to be controversial, but uh, uh, Kathleen was too honest uh, there, <laughs> too. I mean, I was there at the fulcrum where policy uh, and and the CEOs, it all came together, whether it's Competes Act or whatever we were trying to get done, uh, STEM education. Um, the, the business community and the CEOs were happy, and they're truly for all these things, and they'll sign whatever letters. But when it gets down to putting their shoulder to the wheel, to put using their political capital, it's taxes and regulations. And, you know, and so they just weren't ready to make the political, you know, uh, will to go that next step. And we, they're there, we just got to get them to step up and use some political capital. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just also add that on the business side, the involvement of the business community is absolutely critical. And I just want to point out um, something that I interacted with is the American Energy Innovation Council, which is a group of current and former CEOs and chairmen and boards. Uh, Bill Gates, um, Jeff Immelt, uh, Norm Augustine, uh, Chad Holliday, these are all members of that. And they wrote two reports, which I want to bring to your attention, where they actually went through, this is you know, convened by the Bipartisan Policy Center, where they went through actual data as to how much we are investing uh, as a percentage of GDP on research, both public and private, and where we stand in among other countries who are also investing. And it is a striking number, and it's staggering how much little in terms of percent of GDP that we're investing in research. And so I think, you know, it's groups like that. I, I hope that group expands beyond that small group and other CEOs um, uh, join in, because that is a voice which I think is very powerful. And I hope they do what, what you're suggesting, that put the shoulder to the wheel. And, and I think, but we need to bring this group that, we, that is now formed uh, perhaps they could influence the other colleagues in other companies, and, um, and then do that. But it's very important that we do it. Yeah, I think that brings up a, a good point. And 
uh, ITF released a report last year called Atlantic Century 2, where we ranked uh, 45 countries on their innovative capacity and, and how well they've been, I think, moving up or down the chain and found that the United States was second to last in the rate of change and actually getting better in its innovative capacity. While we're still ranked fourth, I think, out of 45 countries, uh, we're losing ground fast. A lot of countries are catching up. So do you think other countries are having these debates in, in their policy circles? Is, is you know, Germany's Congress having a, a, a fundamental debate on the role of government in research? I, I think that the debate is probably more pronounced in the United States than it is in other parts of the OECD. Um, again, you know, to, to me, uh, I, I look with greatest concern at, at the non-OECD countries, where I think is where we're going to see tremendous growth um, in the coming years, and again, especially in India and China. Uh, you know, just sort of anecdotal, um, when I first went to Duke as an assistant professor 20-some-odd years ago, we had about the same percentage of Chinese students in our program then as we do now. Then all of the Chinese students stayed in the United States. They all found a way to stay in the United States. I look at it now and it's probably half of them go back to China. And I think that that is, um, you know, I know China gets used as a bogeyman sometimes, but I, those, those sorts of things uh, concern me. So, no, I, I don't think that there's a debate in China, right? <laughs> I don't think there's any debate at all in China. I think they know exactly where the future lies. Actually, if you read the five-year plan, um, I don't know how many of you have even gone through the five-year plan. This is exactly what they're focusing yeah. on, is the investment in research and innovation. So, yeah, I agree. There's no... But, but uh, it's not limited uh, to China in that uh, I saw Natalie here earlier. She's with the European Institute, and they've had a variety of, of programs where um, the EU understands uh, that their really quality of life is going to be affected. And uh, even in austerity, uh, they have made, you know, big commitments uh, in terms of their budgets, proportionally, uh, to uh, R&D. And they think it's their, they understand it's their route to uh, survival. I'd, I'd like to add that um, I think the debate is over. I mean, one of you all said that earlier. The <laughs> elsewhere around the world, the debate about investment in science and technology is over. They're at it. They're doing it. You know, there's, who cares, you know, who cares about whether it's right or wrong? We're just going to do it. So, for instance. Do it or steal it. That's also <laughs> but, you know, I mean, in our case, uh, last year we opened, for the first time in IBM's 100-year history, we opened two labs below the equator in Australia and in Brazil. And this year, I mean, just within the last couple of weeks, we opened a lab in Kenya. Now, the first invest, major investment in um, the African continent for our company, although we have done high-performance computing in South Africa, but the point here is that... In the United States, we fight tooth and nail for every federal dollar, and we don't know until the continuing resolution, right? <laughs> I mean, we don't know at the end of the fiscal year whether it's even going to be there. Whereas in other countries, they are banging down the doors to come to the IBM company and companies like IBM to invest in their country because they know that it's the engine for growth. And they know that if they build the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and skills are the limiting factors to global investment today. So, I mean, the, the outage in India earlier this week is a huge, <coughs> huge problem. I mean, for lots and lots of reasons. One of them is it creates doubt about, wow, should I, should I, are they ready to take the kind of, um, I was talking about semiconductor manufacturing. Well, you can't do semiconductor manufacturing <laughs> without power, right? So you go, oh, mackerel, should I be doing that? The point is other companies have answered the question and are moving forward, and we're sitting here wondering what we should be doing next. Can I just add this one more thing? If you look at the history of the United States, uh, this was a chart that I saw. In terms of investments in science and engineering and the number of graduates in science and engineering, which is a sort of a marker of how many people are going into it and how much we're investing, there were two big spikes. One was during World War, okay? And the other was post Sputnik, when there were many of the science and engineering uh, infrastructure got created, and many of the departments in various universities expanded. Okay, and for the last forty years, we are seeing the benefits in terms of return on investment of that investment that happened, whether it's semiconductors, whether it's information technology, biotechnology, etc. And I think other nations are looking at that and said, "Hey." That's a model. That's, that's shown success in the United States. Let's copy that. 
Okay, and that's what's a lot of that is happening in overseas and other countries. That, you know, if they can do it, we can do it too. And we should be the one sort of leading for the next one, as opposed to sort of falling back and so that should we be thinking twice or should we have these debates and all that. I don't think it's not, not a, at least out here, as you heard, it's not a question of debate at all. In fact, we should be going even harder at this thing because other nations are now competing, which in the 60s we did not have. I mean, other nations are coming literally every single day with incredible proposals uh, for joint projects, or not just even joint projects. I mean, I'm not talking about coming to IBM, but coming to American industry and saying, if you bring the technology to, whether it's um, semiconductor technology or all kinds of other energy-based technologies or a variety of technologies, come to the, our country and we will give you a tax um, holiday or we'll even pay for the infrastructure, or we'll build the facility. All you guys have to do is bring the equipment and leadership skills, and, and we'll do the rest. That's what's happening. As long as we sit on the sidelines, American companies, when there is a huge uh, uh, uncertainty here, will look to places where there is less uncertainty and where the skills and technology and infrastructure exist. I think that may bring up a good pivot point. So there, there may be, I guess, two ways of thinking this kind of role of government debate. There's one that we need more investment dollars, and then there's the other point of what do we then invest those dollars in. And so I think going back to what Arun said, we need more than just, I think, basic science. We need a, we need more than that. It reminds me that uh, Don Stokes is kind of a leading thinker on this, uh, conceives it as uh, strategic research. And it seems like that's what a lot of other countries are doing. They're trying to tie their, their basic science and their research to things like commercialization and so forth. But in the U.S., that may take actual like new policy, not just investment dollars, but new policy. Is one of you all want to comment on maybe what are the new policy needs here outside of just investment dollars? Let me just you know give an example. A lot of people, you know, for example, Eric and I, we have been in, we've been doing research in our labs, and let me just share. I'll, I'll speak on your behalf. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just share our experience of what, are, what research is in the lab. And maybe I'll just take the example of semiconductors. If you, go, if you look at the development of semiconductors, we all use our iPhones, etc. <coughs> Let's go back to the early stages. And the early stages was basic science of quantum mechanics that started early in the century, in the last century, which led to things like, you know, understanding of, I won't go into the technical details, of band structure, that there are actually energy bands for electrons and holes to move around in a semiconductor. Now, would that be called applied research? Oh, you're doing it because you want to get a profit out of it? No, this is still basic research, okay? Then the Shockley and a few others figured out that maybe you could make a diode out of it, okay? And they were, they were in Bell Labs. And is that basic research? Well, you're making a device, but that's still basic because we don't know exactly how it's going to you know, turn out, whether you're going to get an iPhone later on. We, they didn't know that. And then someone figured out, you know, Shockley and uh, Bardeen and Bracken figured out that maybe you could make a transistor, you could make a diode, and that's a switch. And that switch could then replace the vacuum tube, which is why, which was, now so it was a, it, it was a use-driven thing, but it was still basic research. I'm giving an example because a lot of people think that, oh, this is market. Uh, this is market driven, so the market will take care of it. Well, the transistor, yes, it was use driven, but they did not think at that time when they were doing that research that this is going to change the whole world and you're going to have an information revolution. Well, maybe we should ask those people. They're all dead right now. But you could, you could talk to the people who were in Bell Labs and ask them, did they envision this huge information revolution out of that? They would probably say no. They were doing research. They were trying to follow. They say, hey, you could do this, you could do that, you can tinker. And I think that's the kind of tinkering and innovation that the government can support because we do not have a Bell Labs. And this is the exploration, not into dark matter and dark energy, which is basic science exploration, but exploration into making devices and a few systems to see whether you could do things slightly differently, which may or maybe not pan out into a profit later on in the market. That comes way much later. And in the energy field, some of these technologies that RPE is investing may take 20 years. And the horizon, the time horizon that 
many corporations have, and maybe I'll be corrected, is typically around five to seven years. And that's long term. Oh, that's the long term. That's, that's the long term. Yeah. So there's this big gap out there. What are you going to do for the research that happens, you know, 10 years? That's where the government has to play a role. Well, let me, let me go to Matt's sort of question about doing things differently, and it's sort of what Arun uh, mentions. Um, I think that there has to be a better partnership with the government research and the private sector. I think, you know, you can't just, let's just research, research, and maybe something good will happen. Some of that should happen. But I think the private sector needs to come to, come to the federal government and say, where are those breakthroughs that we need? Uh, and again, semiconductor was an example of that. But I mean, I think, you know, and, and, and that's somewhat within the energy field, what Secretary Chu is doing with his labs, uh, not his labs, but rather the uh, hubs, uh, where they're taking a specific breakthrough. And then once you break through that, uh, then you know the, the uh, it can be have a variety of commercial uh, uses. So I think that we really do need to have a better conversation uh, with the uh, the business community, with the corporate world, and where those breakthroughs. And hopefully by doing that, that might encourage them to get more, you know, more involved. The other thing that we have to do a better job uh, is getting the technology out. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of IP in our labs and our universities. You know, and we have to we got to get it out there better. Um, and again, once again, the Department of Energy, I think, is uh, through their national labs. They're starting a program for a dollar. You can you can get your you can get a, a license on some of these things. So we have to work better on pushing pushing it out there. Also, I think that we probably need to spend uh, to to spread our research dollars more broadly across the technology space. As I mentioned. Three quarters of our research dollars are, are focused on defense and on human health. And I think if you imagine these research dollars as an investment in future economic activity, you know, we do need to spread those dollars across other technology disciplines. I reiterate what's been said, you know, Bart's uh, point about finding ways, mechanisms to get technology out of the universities and into the hands of people who can commercialize it is, is, is absolutely vital. Um, and I think that, that we need to look at a number of models for how we can do that more effectively. You know, you mentioned policy changes or operational changes. Here's one of them. It's this whole issue that I raised earlier around uncertainty. Uncertainty yeah. about the, a life cycle of a program. Is it going to live or is it going to die? ARPA-E is a classic example. The old ATP, Advanced Technology Program, that was an example. TIP. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, whether you like it or not, companies have to make a profit and they have to make a return on investment or else they won't exist. And there are a lot of examples of companies that have uh, not done that and have uh, bitten the dust. And um, so it's uncertainty because companies have um, a portfolio of investment dollars and they look at those dollars they, a annually or even more frequently and they say, okay, I can invest, you know, I'm going to invest in new Horizon projects, I'm going to invest in, continue to invest in my current technology programs, research programs, and I'm going to invest, I'm going to disinvest in some of the other ones, right? So it's, it's a cycle. And so when you are looking for where you're going to invest in the future and you have a partner that is uncertain, whether it's a government or a private sector partner, and everybody is clamoring for scarce dollars, the uncertainty to a certain extent clouds the willingness to invest in certain projects. So it's, um, it's a very... Uh, difficult sell to the technology portfolio managers in a company when you say, well, we don't know if they're going to, we think they're going to, the Republicans are going to vote this way, or the Democrats are going to vote that way, but we don't really know, so, but go ahead, you know, trust us. Well, that doesn't go over too well, you know. So this uncertainty issue is a really troublesome one from a company's point of view. But I, I want to um, emphasize by virtue of an example, the point that I think it was Arun made around serendipitous outcomes from research. You don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be when you make a major investment. I'll give you an example. IBM developed um, a, a technology called the scanning, scanning tunneling microscope back in the mid-80s. It was developed, and actually won the Nobel Prize for that. It was developed to um, understand semiconductor uh, electronics, the movement of electrons. <coughs> So it was very, very sensitive technology, uh, microscope. But as we developed it and after it was put into practice, what happened was that it became useful in areas well beyond 
semiconductors and electrons, and it ultimately became the tool of choice for um, pharmaceutical development and biologists in the development of um, therapies for AIDS and, the, and understanding protein development, protein movement in bodies. So here you is a terribly important outcome, but it was completely serendipitous and completely unintended from the original investment. So the point here is basic research is really important for a whole variety of outcomes, including those that you don't really anticipate. And uh, that's one of the reasons why at least my company continues to do it. Okay. Maybe to push a little harder then. So it seems like 2013 is going to be a key year so that we're not going to have a federal budget at least until after March. Uh, there's going to be no more elections at least for a while. So what would be aside, I guess, what would be your kind of one or two big policy needs? Is it something like expanding the hub model outside of energy? Is it something like harmonizing all of federal research uh, programs so they're all working together? Or is it trying to figure out some way through technology transfer laws to kind of increase industry partnerships at the labs? Like, and what are maybe trying to get a little bit more into the weeds? What are some of the big issues that we need to address? Can we take all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> I do. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, let me just say for, for RPE, um, there was a, you had a, had, a, had a good form on RPE a while back, uh, and um, Rob asked me the question of what's my biggest sort of, or the not, what do you, what's, your worry, what's your biggest worry about RPE? Well, RPE really is, is a tiny little uh, <laughs> group, and, you know, we talk about money, but it's really, it's the people. And uh, it, you know, it, those folks that that take, and also interestingly, I mean, you know, they're by law mandated. They, you know, they're only there for three years unless they, you can get some little bit of extension. So they're they they're focused. Um, but if you ever had a uh, a gap in their funding, then you would lose the people. I mean, so your machinery, you know, it, it, it collapses. And so um, uh, again, and I think. Some of these things that are set up now in the Department of Energy, some of the the uh, the, the hubs, you know, if if you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, and so I think we we've, we've got to maintain uh, these type of programs really are people based. Um, that's where you're going to have the, the you know the worst thing, and then then and then as Kathleen said, we've got to have some certainty, and part of that certainty also is with uh, outside spending money in the in the traditional way. We've got to spend some money. Uh, through R&D uh, tax credits uh, and other research types of credits so that that um, there can be that certainty there in that in that pool. Let me expand on what Bart just said. And this is from my own experience in RPE. Uh, it's absolutely about the people and it's about talent, which is the core competence of competency in the United States. And we have a lot of talent in science and engineering and the infrastructure. Now, there are two kinds of people, so let me separate out a little bit. Number one is that it is very important for RPE to have a sustained increase in budget. Okay? Not a very steep slope, but a slope, a positive slope is very important. Why? Because it then allows you to recruit talent into RPE. And at the end of the day, talent is very important. Really smart people who are in the research community who spend a few years in RPE, serve, and then they go back. <coughs> so they, this is within RPE. If you have a gap in funding, not only will you not be able to recruit, it'll send a signal to the research community that's not a place to go. And you will taint RPE in a very long-term way. That's the talent within RPE. Let me talk about the people that RPE funds. When you look at talent, there are, I mean, I know so many people talented people who could focus on energy, who could focus on information technology, who could focus on health. These are just super smart people. Okay, well, they're in the universities and national labs and all that. Now, they could go many different ways. If there is a gap in funding or if it is not a positive slope, you will find these people saying that, hey, these guys are not serious. Maybe I'll focus on biotechnology and health, which is fine for them. But it's a loss for a nation because you lost talent coming into the field of energy. 
and that is something that is it would be would not be just not good for RPE. It would not be good for the nation as a whole. So I think the sustained funding is for people both inside RPE, and that allows that talent in RPE will then recruit talent from other communities to bring them into energy. Which, for example, Eric has done. He's a biochemist. Uh, funded by NIH and all that, never worked in energy. He got the biochemistry and biology community to start thinking differently about energy and came up and created this whole field of uh, program on electrofuels. And that would not have happened if A, Eric had not been there in RPE, and B, if the funding had not been there to recruit those people and bring them into the energy field. So it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's not just a single you know, talent, it's, it's spread over the whole United States. Here's a quick, quick, quick antidote. In my hometown of Murfreesboro, uh, my, I have a very good friend who's, whose uncle um, went to my home uh, university there, Middle Tennessee, and then got a uh, scholarship to go to the University of Tennessee in economics. Now, he didn't want to, you know, he, he really was going into the sciences, but he got a scholarship for economics. So he went ahead and went, on, went, went to, to there on the scholarship, wound up getting the Nobel in economics. <laughs> but if he had gotten a scholarship, you know, where in what he wanted to do, uh, it, he would have probably been a Nobel. You know, there are those folks, I'm not, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm obviously not what I'm, there are those <laughs> folks up there that just think differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, you know, and you just got to harvest them. They are a resource. I think that uh, trying to replicate the RPE model in other disciplines, and of course RPE was modeled after DARPA, but trying to replicate this model of bringing people to Washington for a short period of time, um, to have them serve and, and then go back to their home institutions is very useful when I think that uh, agencies like RPE that are focused on that very early stage translation, the first demonstration of a technology built on fundamental scientific principles is also something that's very useful. I think that you know if you think about other things that have to happen to make this work, the role of serendipity in discoveries come up several times today. But you know, knowledge unapplied is knowledge shorn of its meaning, right? Is 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 that that famous quote? And and you know, serendipity is is only useful if it's if if it's used to do something after that. Translation is not something historically that the American University has done, right? And many parts of the university, translation and doing practical things is very much frowned upon. And so I think that there also has to be a transformation in the American University, right, where it sees itself as 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 some as as an entity that translates rather than just creates knowledge. And so I think that that you know certainly being an ARPA E and working on this has very much changed the way that I think about my own research and the place of the university in the world. But it'll absolutely influence how I behave. You know what I do go back to Duke, and I think that you know replicating the ARPA E model, creating that group of people who've had that experience, and sending them back to the university can help us actually you know achieve something of, of value from the things that we do. I wonder if I could offer another perspective, or bring up another topic, mm -hmm. which has to do with regulation, because you mentioned that and I mentioned earlier. But just to uh, elaborate on that a little bit, and the role of government, science and technology, and regulation. Um, government plays a huge role as a regulator, and I think this is something that the science and technology community needs to focus on a little bit more than we have in the past. So, for instance, EPA is probably one of the most um, um, influential regulators from a manufacturing point of view in terms of emissions, in terms of a whole host of, of measures that a, a manufacturing organization has to take into account when it chooses where to locate its facilities. So you have science and technology based companies who ultimately make something and they like, in many cases, like to make it here in the United States because it's closer to the home, it's closer to people and talent and resources and investment and all those kinds of things. But when they look at the matrix that goes into making decisions around manufacturing location, sometimes the regulatory stranglehold is so tight here they'll go elsewhere because not only are the incentives else, um, there from other countries, but the regulation, regulatory environment might be more flexible. Not to say that these companies want to do bad things or you know, not meet global standards, but they want to be able to have more freedom of action. And I think this is something this S&T community needs to at least consider as it pushes for political a policy um, well, so, somewhat in that role too is beside regulations there are standards. Oh, exactly. And the National Institute of Standards Technology is a wonderful resource uh, that we have here, uh, where it's non-regulatory, where it does bring the industry together uh, in a collaborative way, and with their own talent also. 
to develop these uh, standards, and, and it's very important in a global economy that they be inter interoperable. And uh, if we step forward and do those, uh, particularly in early technologies where you don't really have incumbent, um, you know, trying to protect them, them, themselves, then we really can become then the national uh, or the international de facto standard. Otherwise, if we don't step forward and do that, uh, then we're going to have to adapt to other large economies to, to be able to get into their economy. So, and they then become the standard. So, uh, there is a very important role uh, for that collaboration with, with, uh, you know, in a non-regulatory way uh, between uh, NIST and other standards organizations and the business community. To, to give you an example of exactly what you're talking about, about maybe 10, 15 years ago, the European Union established a standard on um, ROS, um, restrictions on hazardous substances, which requires there be lead free manufacturing electronics. So the European Union said, we don't want to have any lead based products in our economy. Well, that standard meant that, at least in my field, all the companies had to chase, change the basic science to meet that standard so they could participate in the European market. So the European standard became the global standard because the United States didn't have that standard and wasn't able to adjust their thinking. I mean, I know we participated in all those bodies, the standards bodies in Europe, but ultimately that lead-free standard came into being, and now it is the global standard, and it changed the whole industry, and it cost money, a lot of money, and it cost the leadership. In fact, this is probably the largest cost. The United States had leadership in a number of technologies that had some lead components. But because we had to change and become lead free, if we were here and they were there, this all leveled the playing field. And we lost the leadership, the technology based leadership that we had in those components because of that European standard. I think it might be a good time to open up to the, uh, the audience. Uh, I guess if you do have a question, just raise your hand and just announce who you are and keep it brief so we can get as to many as possible. We'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a question for Arun Majumdar. Uh, but I'm Satish Kulkarni from Virginia Tech. I think you laid out two basic concepts today. One is uh, innovation, which is concepts to reality. And the other one was basic science and sort of not really knowing what are the outcomes or the benefits of basic science. So these are sort of a little bit opposing thoughts in the sense that if I look at the uh, Office of Science in Department of Energy, how would you reconstitute its research program uh, if you were to call it as innovative research? Well, let me just say that you know sometimes in the pursuit of basic science exploration, um, you develop technologies that have so many applications that you did not anticipate before. It's a serendipity part of it. I'll give you one example. We were interested in developing a program in power electronics because we found that there's a big gap in the United States and we had not invested in power electronics. Wide band gap semiconductors. There's and we looked around and we found that because the United States had not invested in power electronics for the last two or three decades, there's a gap in the understanding. There's gap, the, the, the people, the talent pool was not there. Okay, so, but guess where we found it? We found it in high energy physics because they were looking at building accelerators. And in accelerators, you need to have high frequency and high power devices. And that's where the talent came from. So now you ask the question, people were, we are looking at high energy physics because we are looking at basic science. But did they have any idea at that time when they invested that this group of people will, will lead to and perhaps a renaissance revival in power electronics? No. But that's the kind of serendipitous thing that you've got to have in mind. It, certainly, the government should be in, investing in exploratory basic science like high energy physics and dark matter. So but I, I there's so many other spin-offs that come out. But having said that, I'm sorry, you want to know? Having said that, there is a certain use-driven science and research that is also important. I mean, let's go back. Let's go back to historical context. You look at information theory, the theory of information. Where was it developed? Shannon's information theory, okay, about noise and signals, how can he extract it. Where do you think that came from? I and mean, this is fundamental science of information. That came 
out of Bell Labs trying to understand how they could transmit information, what would noise play in, and how can you extract signal out of noise, etc. So you're saying there's no need to recast this the R&D program in the government as it is. No, what you do is you create RPE, right? I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, the Office of Science performs an, an absolutely vital role. There has to be uh, it, it support for curiosity-driven research, for fundamental research that you know builds that foundation. But again, we keep hearing about serendipity. If there's not a mechanism to take serendipitous discoveries and translate them into something that matters, then, then who cares, right? Um, so, so I think that, that there, there, first of all, has to be very much a reimagining of the American university and its place in society. That absolutely has to happen. But I think that, that mechanisms like ARPA-E um, that, that, that provide financial support and, and provide other forms of assistance as well to translate fundamental scientific discoveries you know, into something tangible that the private sector can then take up and take towards market is, is, is absolutely vital. You next. Uh, you've talked, all talked about leadership, and I think one area where now as the U.S. is still preeminent is its research universities. And I was interested in what each of you thought might be the three or four ways that government policy could lose that leadership, things that the government could do or not do that would undermine our preeminence. But you know, financial support. I mean, when pay lines at NIH drop below 10%, it's, 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 it's random. I mean, the system doesn't work anymore. You can't get the reviewers, you know, nobody wants to go to a review panel, you know, when, when maybe one of your pilot 10 applications is going to get funded. It, you, 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 you can no longer encourage, you know, my best and brightest students. It's a tough sell to convince people to go into, in, into academic positions today. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's very straightforward how you can destroy the American university system. Um, just, just underfunded chronically for half a generation and it'll be gone. Well, let me take that back to maybe the beginning too. We are seeing particularly in the public school, schools uh, with, with uh, states cutting back their funding uh, tuition keeps going up, 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 up. And so, you know, it is difficult for students uh, to be able to go and uh, to, to get to college now. And sometimes they have to take maybe a more lucrative, you know, maybe a business school uh, uh, tack out rather than a PhD tack because of the expenses. So I think, you know, also if you underfund in that regard, going back to the, to the thing I mentioned earlier, I think it's critical, and that is uh, international students and being able to keep those international uh, uh, students here. It, you know, it was right after 9-11, the head of the, uh, of the Irish um, university system came in to see me. And uh, in our conversation, he said that they used to never try to get the top students in the world because they're all going to come here. And then after we started pushing them out, by default, some of them started, because they wanted to go, I guess, also to an English-speaking um, schools, so they, he started getting them. And I'm sure that was replicated around the world. And so then they started recruiting uh, more. And so it became, so, you know, we, uh, we're not the automatic place to go any longer. Uh, question over there. Hi, I'm uh, Gabe Nelson. I'm a reporter at Greenwire. I was interested in taking some of the big picture topics that we're talking about and applying it to what you're announcing today with the new energy storage program. So when we're talking about the sorts of things that, um, that you know, the industry can't see the, the immediate, immediate payback in investing in, how did this program come about? Why aren't these sorts of technologies uh, you know, being uh, handed off already? And how do you think you can make a difference in that area? Yeah, well, it's, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to mention that today uh, RPE announced uh, 19 awards uh, totaling $43 million, and the particular group that you're talking about is uh, $30 million in awards that went to a new program called AMPT that's designed to look at battery diagnostics, both real-time uh, and more precise diagnostics that allow us to measure state of health of battery, make prognostics about the future behavior of new battery uh, chemistries, new battery architectures and the idea here is that you're able to capture a much larger fraction of the of the available storage in a battery. Today we use less than half of the available storage in a battery because of concerns about safety, redundancy and, and so on. You know again I think that the, that the answer to your question um, is that there are technologies that are too far from market um, to, to, to encourage the private sector support, right? Um, so again our goal is to de-risk those technologies 
um, and to move them just that little bit closer to market, uh, that they will garner private sector support. So we, we see that we see that over and over and over again. I, I don't necessarily think it's it's fair to say that industry won't invest in in research, but it, it has to be de-risked to a, to a point where where they can justify the investment, and that's that's really what we're trying to do. Go to the other side, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mr. You're next. <laughs> yeah? Sure, you can go okay. next. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> Steve Winters, local researcher. Uh, I, I think I'll leave, the, uh, leave RPE out of the answer to this question. Uh, but uh, I've seen a, a lot of discussions about uh, you know where the highest level of innovation is taking place. The, I, the chief uh, scientist of Intel spoke at Brookings uh, last year, and I was surprised to hear him say that he thought Ar ARPA, DARPA, DARPA, not ARPA, DARPA had lost their mojo, that they were no way the DARPA of the early 90s, and so forth and so on. And he made some arguments for this, and then he said, well, Intel's putting all sorts of money in setting up these consortia of universities around the country to try and recreate what he thought was the high point of innovation at DARPA. So the question is, if you look around, and speaking of which, that was recently announced that the Putin government has decided they can't live without a DARPA of their own, so they're creating a clone of DARPA there to try and keep their defense industries up in the U.S. But however, so the question is, if you look around the world, what would you say are the top three highest level centers of innovation right now? But of course, leave your own. Uh, and, how, and, and then the question is, how, how do you make such, uh, what sort of measure would lead you to that conclusion? Well, I'm a little biased. I'm for the Bay Area. <laughs> And I, you know, I, I know a little bit of what what's going on out there, and I would say the impact of the two research universities of of Berkeley and Stanford uh, has been quite critical. And I think it's not just the innovation that is coming out. The best way to transfer technology is through people, and the university's role is to invest, and this is why, I, I, you know, just to re-emphasize what, what Eric was saying, is really the investment in people. And at, at the end of the day, the government's role is to create, you know, is to, is to get the people out there. Um, and so that the role of those two universities in getting the human capital uh, out there was, has been very critical. And f following that went financial capital also. And this is not just the information the biotechnology revolution that came out of that, a lot of that happened up there. And we are hoping the energy revolution could also. So I, I think the, you know, the role of the universities is absolutely critical. Uh, we happen to have in the Bay Area a few national labs as well. And that played a critical role also. And then the industry partnerships with the universities. You know, just to sort of emphasize one of the points, the thing that a university does in many ways uh, that the industry by itself cannot do. The industry, the people are competing. The university provides a demilitarized zone, <laughs> okay, for for companies, private companies in the same field to come together because there is value that is created in some basic research that is done that could be applied. And in Berkeley, at College of Engineering, at one point we said that we're going to create an IP uh, in a system where it's non-exclusive, royalty-free. Take it, okay? And take it, but it's not one, but many. And so everyone benefits from it. And I think that's the kind of thing that I can talk, and of course there are pockets of innovation like that around the nation, and I think we should be looking to see how we can create not just one Bay Area, but multiple in the United States. I think that's exactly right. And uh, I mean, the Bay Area is a, probably the best world-class example of, of an, an innovative area, geographic area. But there are a lot of other regional innovation hubs, you might yeah. call them, whether it's Berkeley or um, Art Research Triangle Park or the Bay, uh, Boston area or upstate uh, in Washington around the Microsoft Boeing, you know, State Washington University um, location. But um, I, I think this issue around people is really, uh, has to be underscored again and again and again. I'll just say it from a company's point of view. The biggest uh, problem the companies have is finding um, talent, finding the right talent in highly skilled 
jobs. If you if you were to go on to www.ibm.com and look under careers, there's a list of jobs open a mile long, a mile long, all over the world. And the problem is that we can't find the right the people with the right skills to fill those jobs. So the universities have a critical role in creating the skills. And actually, one of the things that I think is really important around this collaborative role of government and universities and companies coming together is to create the environment where companies can come, work with university leaders and students, and build a pool of people, in a, talented people in a technology area so that when they want the companies want to hire somebody, they have a whole pool of people to look to right there in their own program, yeah. their joint program. It's, it's not just, I think those sorts of partnerships are vital not just for training people, uh, but also for making sure that, that, that you know, our best and brightest minds in our university system are focused on problems that really matter to, to, to industry, right? That are real problems. Right. Um, and I think that those sorts of, of interactions reinforce that as well. And it's interdisciplinary interactions. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's bringing you know, bright folks together in different areas to look at how to solve a problem uh, from a different perspective. That's, that's so very key. Can I just make one point? And I know Bart has made this a couple of times and I can't let it go. <laughs> um, since we both are foreign students who came here that's right. as foreign students <laughs> to the United States. And let me just re-emphasize what Bart has said from a foreign student perspective. United States is the only nation in the world which has opened its doors, and this is not just you know, our generation, all the way for 150 years. Go back to the early scientists that came from Europe, where you can have a melting pot of people from around the world, and they immediately absorb into the system. That doesn't happen most parts, in fact, almost all parts of the world, except for the United States. And that's been our core competence to, is to, regardless of where you come from, if you're talented, come in and, and be part of the system. And I think that's a core competence that we should never let go. And I, you know, we, I, I'll say for myself, I'm biased, I'm conflicted in saying that. But I think this is something that, having now that been part of the system, it is absolutely critical. And by the way, you talked about the Chinese students going back, the Indian students are not even applying <laughs> because of the option, which is great. But those, so there may be a situation, which is what other countries are not doing, is to not just wait for talent to come and retain them, is to go out and search for the talented people around the world and bring them here. Well, and I think that we may have to do that. Otherwise, I mean, we're, it's atrophying. I mean, we, you know, we, we're not we're not stagnant. We are we are atrophying. See, I think it's really important for us to recognize that the growth rate around the world is much faster than the growth rate in the United States. For instance, you know, IBM has about 100, uh, has 40, 400,000 plus employees around the world in 135 countries. The United States is the largest country. But where do you think the next largest country is? Well, to my surprise, I learned recently we have 70,000 employees in India. In India, and that's grown over about the last um, less than a decade, and that's because the skills are there, the infrastructure is growing. You don't have to be, you know, sitting in Watson Research Center in New York to participate in global research projects. And the same is true. I mean, if you look uh, at other companies, other countries are making huge investments in their research infrastructure, and they are attracting and retaining their their best and brightest. And so we have to work harder and make this a more attractive place to stay for those students who do choose to come in the first place and reach out to the, comp the skilled leaders around the world and bring them here. If you walk down the halls of IBM Research, English is almost a second language. I mean, 70 percent of the people are from not, not from the United States. My name is Raj. I work with MIT Media Lab and Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. I wanted to speak about the last point that you raised. Initially, I wanted to address it to part, but it seems that everybody has raised the same point. We have seen that magical things happen and innovation happens at the intersection of th uh, three key things. One is technology, the second is leadership, which is people, and the third is investment. And speaking of people, everybody is talking about talent. And off lately, we have seen, at least in the media lab, that there is a dearth of funding uh, into our project. We have been doing this project at the lab for about 18 years. And in the last year, Singapore government, they came and they said that they are willing to invest some $30 million in the Smart Cities Group. And about four to five of the smartest people who have been heading this research project for the past 
17, 18 years, they are now moving to Singapore. And when we go to investors in the US, they actually want cash flow statements of month to month basis. And they want to know when it is going to break even and they are going to make the profit. Whereas in Singapore, they are like, okay, we are going to fund you up until 2025 or 2030. Because we believe that city science and city technologies and smart cities, which are only at the infancy, and it is quite difficult to predict that, okay, when it is going to cut or break even. So this mismatch between technology, leadership, and investment, that is one of the primary reasons that you are actually losing out on a lot of talent because they move to where the investment comes. The talent is quite fluid and the international border borders are quite porous. It is very easy to fly from here to Singapore. And there is another group that is actually moving to London because they are actually getting investment from there. And there is another group moving to Germany. And there is a small group of three people. They went two years ago to Taiwan and now they have actually got a team of about 25 people there. So it is not only the loss of this initial three set of talent, it also takes away the ideas, the technology, but it also helps these things to flourish elsewhere. And the people who are not making the right decision, I don't know what to ask to them. So you can ask the right questions. Well, I think, you know, we, we touched on this earlier and, and the point is that as you've raised, this is happening, it's going to happen. You, you can't sort of bury your head in the sand, right? And, and a decision not to participate is a decision and it's a decision that's going to have real consequences and I think that the things that you're talking about are, are great examples of, of those real consequences. It's just going to move someplace else. And just, just exactly as Arun said that uh, US actually brings a lot of international students and I know a lot of students at MIT who get scholarships from 200,000 to 400,000 or even above that. But once their research is over, they cannot actually stay here for multiple factors. For example, if they have to start a company based on their ideas, if they perform a group, there is a US law requirement that they should actually invest some one million dollars from their own pocket to stay here. But there are countries like Singapore or the Middle East, Abu Dhabi, they say that you can actually come to our country and we are willing to pay you $500,000 starting salary, we'll give you a house and we'll give you two cars. And <laughs> I'm well, not joking, I know, it's I mean, true. I know we have been tough on the United States. It is still the best place in the world. It is, it is the best place that people do not want to leave. But And I think, you know, you're right. But I, I, I think a lot of people want to be here and come here because of the fact that we have this critical mass. I mean, if they want to go to Abu that's great. You know, that's fine. They don't have a critical mass of scientists and engineers um, who they can partner with, who can, who can push them in the challenge and, and take on real, you know, important issues. So I think the United States is still the best place. I, I'm just concerned that if you don't keep that going, we may fall behind. But at this point, I mean, it's still a wonderful place to be. And so I just want to keep that on, on the record, that it is uh, still a great place to be. And I think we should just keep that going and double down on this. But we, uh, yeah, right. It, it is, it absolutely is. But we have a moral imperative to leave it that way for our children. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I think leads to maybe the, the next step. Um, I was mentioning earlier, um, when the uh, Norm Augustine and Craig Barrett and, and Steve Chu, when they were testifying before us, uh, on the Science Technology Committee about rising above the gathering storm, because we had, we had asked them to put that together, the National Academies. Uh, I remember very distinctly telling Norm Augustine, you didn't tell us anything that we didn't already know. You just put it together in a, in a good blueprint, which then I was able to take and, 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 and put into authorization. Um, and so the next step, we know, I, mean, I don't think there's anything that's been said, I don't think we said anything particularly you know, bright or the ending of that you didn't know. And so the next step is how do you, how do you implement that? You know, maybe somebody can, can come up with something new, but you know, if we just did what we're talking about, you don't need a lot more. So yeah. that's what we have to do. We have to, the next step is how do we implement these things that we know into legislation, into, into appropriation or into the corporate mentality? You know, how do we do that? And that's, that's our next step. We don't need any more what do we need to do kind of stuff. I think the green card part is very simple. Right. Well, it's Tom Friedman, simple. right? Every advanced degree, every <laughs> green card it, 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 Well, it's simple to <laughs> state. To, to state. It, it, is a, it is a more difficult to implement, and that takes legislation, but that can be done. I mean, we, that's what, you know, there needs to be a discussion. I, you know, I think I know how to do that, you know, but how do we take that next step uh, to implement that green card? Uh, Okay. Hi, my name is Michal Haramati and I'm actually a, a summer intern and a graduate student at UC Berkeley. 
Um, and no my bears. Car- <laughs> <laughs> um, for those Stanford people in the room, I'm sorry. Um, so I guess. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, you know, there's an opportunity cost to taking talent away from other areas, research areas and industries. So I, I think I, I'd like to hear from the panelists about how we can grow the pool of talent and um, nurture skills w- which can be used to, to be effective, um, particularly at our universities, so that rather than kind of looking and saying, like, who can we grab? And, and viewing talent as a, a finite resource, we can develop what we have here and, and try to get more out of our students. STEM education, you know, it's more than just universities. You've got to start in the, the early years. It's K to 12 uh, STEM education. Let's grow them. Middle school is very critical. <coughs> From my experience, I have two daughters who went through that and now I'm looking at engineering. But middle school is so important where we need to support that and, and you know, and frankly, invest in that to get people into science. Investment is not just capital investment, it's human investments as well in trying to get that pool into science and engineering. In Rising Above the Gathering Storm, they told us that um, something like, you know, something like 56% of the math teachers in middle school had neither a certification to teach math or a degree in math. It was 80 something, high 80 something percent of the physical science teachers. So, you know, it's hard to teach a course, no matter how good your teacher you might be, if you don't have the, the core understanding. Um, you know, and then taking some of those recommendations uh, from, uh, we did set up a number of programs, and actually President Obama announced, I think, a very good initiative just the other day in the, in the STEM area where we're trying to uh, recruit more STEM teachers, grow those STEM teachers, and quite frankly, pay them uh, more, uh, the ones that are exceptional. Um, a, a, a quick, another quick anecdote, Norm Augustine, who we've talked about before, who was the former CEO of uh, Lockheed, and lots of, he's a wonderful fellow that most everybody knows. He quit being the chairman of Lockheed so that he could teach in high school math. He wanted to do that. Uh, but he couldn't get hired in Maryland, where he lived, because <laughs> he didn't, ha- you know, he only, he only had a master's in engineering for Princeton, and he did, so he didn't have a, a teaching degree, so he couldn't, he couldn't have it. So, um, Princeton, being no dummy, uh, <laughs> hired him to teach uh, math there. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot that we can do and should do to make this process of growing our talent better. But we don't want to wait till they get to college. To there's a, there's one thing we haven't talked about at all. That's the role of community colleges, yep. and this is really an important Very. role that community colleges can play because they can be much closer to the workplace. They're a lower cost approach yep. for a, a wider variety of students. And I mean, I know in our company and in lots of companies, they have very tight relationships with local yeah. community colleges, so that the skills, the actual skills yeah. that are needed for day to day success and productivity in the workplace can be can be Absolutely. taught at community colleges. I think this is an area of, of very unique resource in the United States. A lot of other nations don't have this kind of a community college system. I think we ought to be thinking more carefully about the linkage between community colleges, universities companies and um, government at large. Absolutely. Uh, let me just also add that this is the 150th anniversary of the land grant, more Act yeah. for uh, land grant universities. And if you go back and, and see the impact sure. of uh, the land grant and public universities have had in educating and providing access to education mm-hmm. for the masses, which was not there. Uh, before you know, 1860, 1858, 1862, um, it's been it's been huge, and if you now look at and that's one of the shocks that I got when I went back to California is what's going on in California education system, and um, in both the the, the uh, community colleges mm-hmm. and the Cal State universities, which produce a lot of people, and of course the University of California system, we sp- in California they spend more on prisons than the education system, which is just absolutely appalling. But that's what is going on, and I think there needs to be, I mean, I, I don't know what the solution is, uh, but there needs to be a, a federal state partnership of some kind, I don't know what it is, which was what the land grant thing was mm-hmm. at some point, but maybe it's a different, so that this access to education is, does not go away. Because if with the tuitions, uh, tuitions rising, 
and that access may actually go away after a while. And so that's what I'm what my concerns are. I think we have one more question. Hi, I'm Mark Philbrick, I'm a AAA fellow, also from Berkeley, but I went to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for the RBE folks. So the one thing you guys are modeling for DARPA, the big advantage they have over y'all is that they are their own customer. And you are just getting to the point where some of your first grantees are about to graduate. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about you know, taking the next step in, in translating serendipity into marketplace success as appropriate. Yeah, I, 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 it's wonderful that you answered that, asked that question because it gives me an opportunity to introduce Dr. Cheryl Martin at the back of the room who heads our tech to markets operation. And we certainly recognize right at the very beginning that this was a fundamental difference between DARPA and ARPA-E is that we have to find ways to keep our technologies moving uh, towards market. Um, so Cheryl, who came to us from Roman Haas and then Kleiner, uh, and her team work with our performers and also our, our program directors uh, to find, to, to, to help our performers uh, generate realistic plans to help their technologies to continue to move towards market. Um, after we've left. So we certainly recognize that as an issue, and I think Cheryl and her team have done a great job in helping our performers with exactly that. Last question. I have one more question. There's a lot of nostalgia about Bell Labs. <laughs> you have that no was idea. A, that was a model <laughs> where corporations funded a lot of R&D. Now, in the view of the panel, what has replaced Bell Labs or it's just the rearrangement of the ecosystem. Well, having, not having been in Bell Lab, I do speak a lot about it, don't I? Um, and that's because of interacting with a lot of people. The boss. Uh, well, the boss, certainly. <laughs> but it's, I mean, I've been interacting with Bell Labs people for the last 20 years. I've collaborated with them back in UC Santa Barbara and Berkeley and other places. <coughs> and so you do get to hear about that. Um, I think, so if you ask what was Bell Labs, and I, I'm talking about someone of an, as an outsider and only hearsay, is the fact that they, a, they had investments that was, um, you know, that, that was already there in the company and they had to, the bureaucracy was very little. The managers of there were some of the best scientists who could decide that this is a good area and they would go ahead and, and, and they had the money to be able to do that. They brought in talent, and they were extremely good uh, in bringing in talent. And when I say Bell Labs, by the way, I also worked a lot with the IBM Research Labs and STM and AFM and all that, and they do the same as well. Right. And so this kind of a, you know, bringing in talent, having them follow their instincts on ideas, vetting them with the managers who are some of the best scientists, and then investing in them, and allowing them to to push forward their ideas, I think it's something which is. Um, you know, was unique in many ways. And you had, I mean, this is what I heard. You walk down the corridor, you had the experts in surface science versus experts in information theory right all in the same unit. And I think so, you, you, which is what drove the creation of the energy innovation hubs, that you bring talent under one roof, give them the investment, allow them to make decisions on the fly because you've got smart managers who are smart scientists themselves and let them operate and let them figure out, carve out and chart out the course is something which has worked in the past. I don't Can think I we should... Go ahead, no, wait. Well, I just want to comment on the nostalgia for Bell Labs a little bit. I think, you know, we all talk about Bell Labs with, oh man, that was really great. But we forget that that was a lab in a monopoly That's company. Right. That's exactly and right. And <laughs> a monopoly company enabled that kind of a structure to exist. Right. And that was then and this is now. You know, We don't have a monopoly in any industry to speak of today. So in companies, there is tremendous pressure to perform. And it's, you know, what did you do for me lately? And so for a company to make a long-term investment it takes a lot of, of uh, what do you call it, intestinal fortitude to stand up to the stockholders and say, this is the right thing to do for our company and for our industry. And so we have this great nostalgia for Bell Labs, but we have to recognize we're in a living in a different world and we can try to build structures that respond and create the world we want to be in, but not just bemoan about the world that is that, gone. Or I would suggest that our national laboratories uh, are the infrastructure 
uh, for uh, uh, the new Bell Labs. Uh, I, I think, and they're going through some thought process of how they can better be run, uh, but I, I would think that you would, before you're going to start something up new, that you would want to look to the national labs and see how they can uh, make a better contribution. I think we'll end it there. I'll give you one last chance. So we know what to do. We know the problems. What's it going to take for Congress to act? <laughs> we you can't say you can to respond to that one. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that uh, we need to be a little more clear about the solutions uh, and about the benefits. We have to bring in a coalition. Uh, again, you know, it can't be done without the business community uh, being a part of, of all of this. And I think if we bring that coalition, universities, business communities, uh, with some practical solutions that we can, we can, I think, get something accomplished. And everything is not just money. Some of it is, again, how to get the technology out better. Immigration is not a matter of, of money. So, I, I, you know, I'm optimistic that if we, again, bring folks together, we can, we can um, come to some, get through political gridlock. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Give me the last round of applause.